I got really good at practicing Jack Daniels. I woke up every day, drank it for breakfast, drank it for lunch, drank it. I got good at saying yes to Jack Daniels, so I had to get good at saying no. And for the second time in my life, I was scared. The first time was going into prison. Now I'm scared to get out. I said, God, the, the men that you anointed to mentor me did not make it out there. So how am I going to make it? I came up for my first parole, denied. Uh, second parole, denied. Then I come up on what, what Texas calls your short way. And they voted to take my short way away and not let me out. So now I've got to. I've got to explain to my cellmate, hey, I'm going to be singing this song pretty loud. Can you put your earplugs in or do whatever? But this is just something I told God I was going to do. And I had to change. One of my people was I had to, I had to give up my best friend. Literally, in the middle of his sermon, he just stops and says, you know what? Uh, I need to say this for somebody. You've been waiting for a dream to happen for almost five years, and you're about to give up. Don't give up. It's about to happen. Have you ever been in the middle of a major change in your life? Maybe this change that you are experiencing is actually the consequence of your own bad choices. But maybe now you are on the right track. God has shown you the way, but you keep experiencing setback after setback. And you are wondering, how long will this process take? Maybe this new change in your life is a calling. You feel God leading you down a new path, but you are frustrated because the process of reaching this calling is actually taking way too long. How do I stay on track with this new change in my life? What prayers should I pray? How long do I wait? How do I keep myself from becoming so frustrated that I simply give up change altogether? These are the topics that I want to discuss with our guest today as he finishes his life change story with us. If you haven't listened to the previous episode, I want to encourage you to do so. I'm Eric Hutchinson, and this is the If Nothing Changes podcast. Previously on J. Dan's Story. And uh, there's this 1% of my, my life, my heart, that I just wasn't ready to yield to God yet. By rejecting God to the degree that I did, Satan's like, okay, I got 100% of this dude now. There I was, you know, from a little boy growing up in church to now sending prostitutes out to men on Christmas Day. Man, day one in prison was crazy. Crazy, yeah. crazy, crazy, crazy. Tell me about day one. Now I'm calling this, this gentleman that Jesus died for that's made in God's image. I'm calling him these names. And to me, even knowing that I worked at the escort service, I feel like that moment, talking to another human being that way that I've never done before, was the lowest moment of my life. But we we go into solitary confinement, and I'm laying there. I'm thinking about my life. I'm like, this is the sum of all the decisions I've made up to now, and this is it. I said, God, there's, so, there's nothing in me that wants to stop drinking Jack Daniels or smoking cigarettes, so you're going to have to do something in me that I can't do in myself. When I went to sleep, he delivered me from the desire to drink Jack Daniels and smoke cigarettes. And I didn't know what to think. And so I felt it and I began to thank him. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you did. And I ain't even going to question it, but something's different. And now the rest of J. Dan's story. J. Dan, you have just had an experience with God, and he has healed you from addiction to Jack Daniels and smoking. But now what? He said, now I want you to work on your profanity and your gambling. And right then I said a cuss word because <laughs> I was like, oh, this is going to be so hard. And he took me through a, a September, so football. And like I said, I already had, I already had parlay bets out. And, and when you in prison try to tell somebody you're, you're not gambling anymore, that's a fight. So he said, for your protection, just finish all the bets you've got, but don't make any new ones. And so I'm like, all right, well, I kept relapsing with my cussing. I kept relapsing with my gambling. Because, guys, as soon as you stop, you know, I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going to go on a diet. That's when the cake comes out. That's when all the great people want to buy you drinks. People want to whatever. And 
people knew I was going to quit gambling. So they're like, all right, I can give you the Cowboys at 21 points. So I'm like, oh, God, even you know that's a good bet. So I would relapse. I'd be like, God, I keep relapsing with my cussing and my, and my, my gambling. Can you help me? And he said, yes, but you need to trust the process. Anytime God mentions the word process to me, I just cringe because I know it's going to be a tough one. And and so he gave me he gave me the processes to 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 quit eventually both of those. And and it was it was it was a tough process, especially for being in prison and trying to quit gambling and quit, and quit cussing. And but he knew he had to work on my pride too. So it involved some apologizing to people for cussing. And that made that made them make fun of me. And it was a tough process. But in the end, four months later, at that point, I never cussed again except for illustration purposes. Uh, I never, never gambled again with money uh, of my own that I could lose and all that. I never did any of that stuff. And so what I learned was that God likes to deliver us out of stuff and from stuff. And he will if he needs to. But man, his desire is to shoulder walk shoulder to shoulder with us, lock arms and say, let's do this journey, this recovery journey together. And so, so I got to experience the instantaneous deliverance and the journey of deliverance and the, the, the journey of recovery. And, uh, and so that's why I tell people when they say, I can't quit this. And I said, well, if, if God hasn't delivered you out of it and from it yet, that means he still sees something inside of you that he knows he could partner with you and go through a recovery journey together. So don't give up because it's going to happen. And so at that point, man, it's, I came out. You know, I came out of recovery or a, a solitary confinement, a new man, and then after that, four months out of solitary confinement, then I was uh, then I was free from my those current addictions. So, how long were you in prison before you went into solitary confinement? Was that the first year? Uh, July seventeenth was when I got into prison, two thousand three. So September eighteenth, two thousand three was when I got locked up in solitary confinement. For, so for several months. You know, you mentioned being miraculously, you know, healed uh, from You're healed, from yeah. from your addiction, and uh, then you know, and I get in, in prison. I you can smoke, and the you know you cussing, and you know that kind of stuff. I I get that process. Right. So, but Jack Daniels, that was your substance of uh, choice, and I mean, you really didn't have access to that in prison, right? Uh, wrong. So now at the unit that I was at right then, I, there was no way, but I immediately, after I got out of solitary confinement and went through that football season and de- deliverance, healing and all that, a couple of months after that, I made trustee. And then they, they moved me to a trustee camp and the trustee camp, there were no fences and we were right on the highway. And so I began to hear things like, well, this is how we get stuff in people, our family or whatever, drive by on the service road, throw stuff out in a, in a, in a, you know, in a little padded uh, brown bag. And then the outside trustees that pick up the trash on the front of the lawn, you know, you just give them some, some cigarettes and give them some soups or whatever. And they pick up your package for you and bring it to you. So uh, yes, there was Jack Daniels. There was, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Dip, people had cans of dip you know, stuff that you can't buy on commissary. And uh, so it was available. It was available. Uh, but I will say at that point, those those four things really didn't bother me much after that. Every once in a while, somebody goes, hey, do you ever want to drink again? And I'm like, well, I'm tempted. The devil's not ever going to quit trying to get me to drink. Uh, but I've said, I've said no so much. And this is the message that I preach in recovery. You get good at what you practice. I got really good at practicing Jack Daniels. I woke up every day, drank it for breakfast, drank it for lunch, drank it. I got good at saying yes to Jack Daniels, so I had to get good at saying no. And I wasn't very good at first, you know, uh, it, at least in my mind, because there were times where I was like, you know, I wonder if I was out right now, would I go buy some? You know, and again, even though God, you know, I think took it away, I think, he still gives us free will. He didn't take my free will away. I could I could undo anything he did, and so, uh, so yeah. But it, so it was it was tough, but not tough. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. And uh, but you know, but at one point I was like, he's like, I'm going to put you uh, with these guys, and they're going to mentor you. 
two guys. And I'm like, okay, great. Well, one of them's younger than me, and I hate taking, you know, advice from a, a kid younger than me. But he said, he said, these two guys are important for you to learn from. He said, because they haven't been serving me very long, but they have an intimate relationship with me that you have never experienced. So, uh, but yeah, at, at that point, they're mentoring me, and I kept growing stronger in the Lord, stronger in the Lord, pushing those old, those old, um, muscle memory from my old life out and i've learned so much about god's science that he created you know the neural pathways that we create in our brain that we're so used to taking that if we don't create new ones then we're going to go back we're going to get on that same that same highway that we used to if we don't intentionally okay that's my favorite word intentionality intentionally create new patterns new ways and um, and those guys were great to me, man. They were patient with me. I was patient with them. And uh, and they got out. And I'm like, they're going to go change the world. One went home to a bad halfway uh, house. One went home to a bad family environment. And they were both back in prison before I made parole. And at that point, Eric, at that point, I, I said, God, I got some questions. And for the second time in my life, I was scared. The first time was going into prison now i'm scared to get out because my the i said god the the men that you anointed to mentor me did not make it out there so how am i gonna make it and he said i'm gonna give you this dream and as long as you pursue this dream you'll never come back to prison in this capacity and when he said that god always speaks to us in the language he knows we can understand here and when he said that i knew what he meant and so I uh, I sat down with God, and he said that, as long as you pursue this dream. I'm like, well, what's the dream? And he eventually started showing me that out of that need, out of that crisis that I saw for those men that didn't have a safe place to parole to, the, the desire to create that safe place arose in me. And God began cultivating that dream. You're going to have this. And then, you know, eventually, you know, uh, was what we had the transitional house. We opened that in 2012. And, and that's still going. We're doing it 12 years later. We're still going with that. So let me ask you a question. So I want you to, you know, for the listeners, how long you actually spent, you know, in prison, what was it like whenever you first got out? And then the process, I love what you said about the process, because, you know, if God just miraculously healed me from pornography, I couldn't, I didn't learn anything. I didn't right. learn I didn't learn anything and I can't teach someone else how to how to get out of that that bondage. And so I love what you said about the process. I think God intends, you know, even Paul, you know, after the road to Damascus, it was 2 or 3 uh, years totally. before he actually went out and started preaching. And so there's a process that needs to take place and that's part of the miracle because he teaches yeah. Yeah. us something. My wife once asked me, "Can you ever stop going to recovery meetings?" I said, well, I, I might, I don't know, but I don't want to find out because I've built some new neural pathways right. that have yeah. changed my life and I don't ever want to go back. So tell us, tell right. us a little bit about how long you were in the, in prison and then how did, how did you transition when you got out? So it's really interesting. Uh, I went into County jail, got arrested, uh, on April 9th, 2003, just before Easter. And then I get out three years later. Um, so I did about all, a little two and three quarters years in prison. And then the other three months of that was in county jail. But I went in county jail, got arrested for that last time, April 9th, just before Easter. And then I'm coming up. So one of the prayers I prayed in, in solitary confinement was, God, don't let me out of here until you know I'm ready to never come back. And that's a hard prayer to pray. That's like if you were to say, God, I'm going through a trial right now, but don't let me out of this trial until I've learned what you want me to learn. Who prays that? Nobody prays that. So I'm like, okay, well, I came up for my first parole, denied. My parents were crying, but but it was expected, you know. Uh, second parole, denied. Parents were bawling because they kind of expected me to make my second parole. Then I come up on what, what Texas calls your short way. So... The long way discharge is if you do your whole five years. 
they they give you a short way date to say, okay, this is the date where if you've done everything right, we feel like we can go and let you out on this date. Okay. And my short way was two and a half years. So I get denied twice, first parole, second parole. Then I come up with my short way. They can still vote on that short way. And they voted to take my short way away and not let me out. So I was like, okay, God, I know what I prayed. I know I prayed, don't let me out until you know I'm ready to never come back. But now for the first time, I prayed differently. I said, so now, Lord, what do I need to do to get ready? I'd never ask him that. I just knew that he wasn't going to let me out until I was ready, but I never prayed. What do you want me to do? What do I need to do to get ready? And so this was uh, this was like March 2006. And uh, it was right when Chris Tomlin's How Great Is Our God came out. And he said, and we had our radios, he said, and that was playing on the radio right then. He said, I want you to sing this song as loud as you can whenever whenever you hear it on the radio. And I'm like, okay, all right. And uh, and then he said, I want you to start reading the book of Acts. All right, great. He said, I want you to do a chapter a day. He gave me specific requirements because he knows I don't like to follow the rules. So he wants to give me rules to see if I'll follow them and be obedient. So he said, I want you to read a book, uh, the book of Acts, a chapter a day, no more, no less. And then I want you to do it in the morning and chew on it all day. Great. No problem. So I start reading the book of Acts. I start singing that song every time it comes on the stupid radio. And it only came on like two or three times in a whole day until that moment. Now it comes on at every count time. Now count time is when everybody gets into their cells and everybody's, you know, either quiet or listening to everybody else in their cells. So now all of a sudden I'm in the, my cell with my cellmate, two men cells. And now I get, and God said at the top of your lungs, as loud as you can. So now I've got to, I've got to explain to my cellmate, Hey, I'm going to be singing this song pretty loud. Can you put your earplugs in or do whatever? But this is just something I told God I was going to do. So now I'm doing that. And then all the other guys in the, in the, in the dorm, the pod, 56 men are at first saying, shut up, gum, shut up. You know, what are you doing? You can't sing. And I'm like, I'm agreeing with them. I can't, you know, and I don't want to do this, but this is just what I have to do. I promised God. And so every day, chapter of Acts, every day singing that song. And, you know, by on the last day of, um, of the book of Acts, the next day, or the, later that evening for the day of mail call, they bring me a lay-in. In Texas, what a lay-in is, a piece of paper that shows you have an appointment for the next day. They bring all the lay-ins at night, so you let you know you got to be, you got to make that appointment. So, mine says, lay-in for parole, 9 a.m. On the 29th day of reading 28 chapters of Acts, I go in, and they give me my short way back. They said, you're going home on April 18th. Now, there's that number eight again, April 18th. There's a number, another number eight, and all the numbers are dealing with me. And you know what's funny? When you look back at those 28 days, at the beginning, everybody was yelling at me for singing, saying I, I, I was horrible and all this stuff. To the end, the last week or so, everybody was, more people than not, was singing with me. Wow. You know? And so, so, uh, so, my mom and dad finally, you know, it, th- when they took my short way away, my mom and dad was, they were crying big time. And I said, mom, I had never told you all this, but this is my fault. Like what? They, they're denying me because of, of a prayer I prayed. And I said, but when I come back, I told God not to let me out until he knows I'm ready. And he, he knew I wasn't ready those three times, but now he's, he's letting me go. So, I said, now it's going to be for good. So I get out. Oh, man. You know, and uh, and I just I just started enjoying. I, I don't have to run around. I, I was a runner back then. I'm not anymore. And uh, but I, I used to run around the rec yard. Now I could run along the highway and I could run through neighborhoods. And I just enjoyed all that. My mom, the first, I got out on the morning, 10 a.m. on a morning. And my mom and dad drove up to see me. And they drove up to pick me up. And they had my little niece, Skylar, in the car with them. So the one that I I looked at through plexiglass when she was first born now is picking me up from prison. But later that night, my mom had 50, 60 people meet me 
at a, at a restaurant. They said, where do you want to go? And I said, CC's pizza. And, uh, and I go, when I go into prison now, uh, I tell people, look, when, when, when your family or anybody asks you where you want to go eat on your first meal, dream bigger than CC's pizza. <laughs> you know, there's so many more places that I could have said, but I just, to me, that was fine Italian dining. But 50, 60 people showed up to 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 endure the the the, the CC's pizza to welcome me home. No. And uh, there was six six months before I got out of prison. I was about to pray a prayer, and I was going to pray a prayer and commit my life to God as a single man in ministry like Paul. And uh, and and I just felt like God was saying, "Wait, why are you fixing to pray this to me?" And I said, "Because no woman deserves my baggage, and you've." you want me to build this ministry. And I know, I know I can get distracted with women, girlfriends, relationships. So I would rather build the ministry and not have a distraction. And he, and he said, he said, no, time out. He said, don't, don't pray that prayer because I have someone set aside for you. She's not going to be a distraction for you. She's going to help you build the ministry. She's not going to see your past as baggage. She's going to see it as leverage to advance the kingdom of God through testimony. And so I started praying for my wife. And anyway, it ended up being somebody that I knew all my life. I coached her in eighth grade basketball. And, uh, and, and, and then we got married two years after that on April 18th, 2008. Two years to the date I got out of prison. I said, hey, this is the same date. You chose a date that I got out of prison. Are you sure you want to share our anniversary with my release date? She said, yes, because that means we'll never forget our anniversary. Tell us, tell me about your ministry. Tell me what, you know, how, how, how God led you into that. I know you got the vision, but how did that, uh, take place? And, uh, and then maybe tell me a little bit about what's going on right now. So, you know, I, I try to tell people in prison or even in recovery when there's a, when there's a starting over point, make sure you understand that it, whatever you, God's given you to do. It's going to take time, and and I and that's and I am the most impatient guy around, and it was it was such an interesting time because for five years we didn't have a transitional house, and the first vision he gave me in prison what seemed more like a ranch than than a transitional house like in the city, so I was looking for ranches. I was looking for ranches because I thought God was just going to plop a ranch in my lap in my lap, and. I kept getting discouraged, but he said, just do your spiritual job. I couldn't get, a, 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 I couldn't find a really good job at all. He said, just do your spiritual job. So I would go to hospitals, pray for people that overdose. I would go to rehabs. I would go and, and uh, visit people in county jail. I would do air. I would do all this stuff, mentoring, discipling. We had services. I mean, we, we started the ministry in 2007, January, 2007. I went and filed the paperwork, DBA. Uh, had to do the name search to make sure nobody else had the the the, the, the name for him felons. Luckily, nobody had that name, uh, and and so we we started services. We had 50, 60 people, but I didn't want to be a church. It was like we were almost like a church. I'm like, that's not what I want to be, God. When is this thing going to start? So somebody said in 2011, they said, just start looking for a house. Don't look for a ranch. Just start looking for a house, and I and I and I did. Now. I was about to give up in 2011. I was about to give up. My pastor and his wife invited me and my wife to Louisiana with them to a conference called Compassion Conference. So we go to this Compassion Conference, and we're listening to everybody. It's great, man. I, I know all their stories. I'm, I'm inspired. But there's this one guy that gets up there. I have no idea who he is. And his name is Bill Shear. He's a pastor of Guts Church in Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I'm like, oh, Guts Church, that's pretty cool. He's got a great story. And literally in the middle of his sermon, he just stops and says, you know what? Uh, I need to say this for somebody. You've been waiting for a dream to happen for almost five years and you're about to give up. Don't give up. It's about to happen. We started our, our actual ministry in January, 2007. This is January of 2012 when we're at this conference. My pastor and his wife looked down at me and smiled. I'm like, did y'all, did y'all stick this up? <laughs> And they're like, no. And I'm like, so that was the middle middle of January. Two weeks later, this guy Marty calls me and says, "I hear you want to do a prison min or a transition house ministry." I said, "Yeah." He goes, "I think I have a house for you." Closed on the house in mid February. We opened up our 
we opened up the first side of that duplex on May 1st, 2012. And uh, it was crazy because in May of 2012, I started my own business. We opened up the the ministry house and we had our first child together. And so since then, man, we've served, gosh, I want to say over 300 just with the transitional house uh, of guys coming out of prison that just they, they want to change their people, places and things. Because that's what I tell everybody. You know, life is all about people, places, and things. You can't get away from that. It's the people you hang out with, the places you go, and the things you do. I went to prison because of the people I hung out with, the places I went, the things I do. I've stayed out of prison almost 18 years because of the new people I hang out with, the new places I go, and the new things I do. And I had to change. One of my people was I had to, I had to give up my best friend. But in return, God gave me my wife, Jessamine. And so God is never going to leave us lacking in your recovery journey. There's going to be stuff you have to give up, but God is waiting to replace those things with something better, something brighter and bigger and, and longer lasting. And so much, you know, the, the, he gives joy for, uh, for sorrow. He gives uh, beauty for ashes. He loves to replace things. He doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. That's a three for one. That's a that's a good ROI there, you know. And so that's you know that's uh, so we've had our ups and downs of the recovery ministry uh, or the transitional house, but man, it's been the most challenging and most fulfilling and rewarding thing I've ever done. And so. I can't serve. I I tell people I still get drunk. I just switch bartenders, (laughs) you know, because I can't serve God any less than I serve the devil. And even when we butt heads with guys and they end up back in prison, almost a hundred percent of the time we get letters from them saying, I wish I'd have listened to you. I know that the rules, the parameters and the guidelines that you set were for my good. And and I want to apologize. And so, man, I just love, and then now a lot of them are serving the Lord and, my daughter is the co-host of our podcast. You know, we, we do a little 10, 15 minute announcement before we do the interview. And she's the, and then, and now we get letters from, from moms, dads in prison and, and grandpas saying, just to see you and your daughter, your relationship gives me hope that one day I can be restored to my daughter. And, uh, and we're just, man, we're just loving life now. And, like I said, I still get drunk. I just switch bartenders. When when one of our former residents sends me a picture of himself in front of the home he just bought because of a class we connected him to, and he got funded through the mortgage company that my wife works for, that's better than any Jack Daniels buzz I've ever gotten in my life. So how does someone who's listening to this podcast – find out about forgiven felons? How do they find out about your ministry? And maybe they know someone that, you know, needs, needs that. So how do they, how do they find out about it and get information? The easiest, shortest answer to that is to go to our website, um, forgivenfelons.org. And from there, you can uh, watch the podcast, a video podcast on our YouTube channel. Uh, You can also uh, listen to it on all the podcast platforms, the audio version. You can learn a little bit about the house, what we do, we where we go into prisons. And uh, but also, you know, if you have a loved one in prison, I think we're in we're in 34 institutions, jails and prisons, 3,400 institutions all across the nation. So we may wow. be in in your loved one's prison already. We're not in any federal, so state only and county jails. So if your loved one has a tablet and it's through Securus, make sure you tell them to look us up on the Forgiven Felons channel background check podcast and they can hear all of our content. So Jay, if you could summarize or condense your message to the listeners, people that are listening, what's the one message, the one thing that you want to emphasize to them most, what would that be? Never give up, never give up. Uh, And it's okay to feel the feelings of wanting to give up. Just don't let them win. Even Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, wanted to do things a different way than the way that was planned out to the point where he was sweating blood. But he said, nevertheless, that was the first, if you, you, if you learn that King James word, nevertheless, you will, you will find a way not to give up because it's okay to acknowledge the pain, acknowledge what you're going through, acknowledge your past. But then you say, nevertheless, I'm not giving up. 
thanks, J. Dan, for sharing the rest of your story with us. Hey, if you are listening today and you are going through some major changes in your life, maybe these changes are simply consequences from your past actions. Maybe you are trying to make a change, but you have become so frustrated with the amount of time that this change is taking. Or maybe you've just realized that you need change in your life. No matter what the case is, change is possible. However, if nothing changes, nothing changes. See you next time. If you are still listening and you liked this podcast, I want to encourage you to listen to previous episodes because they will help to inspire change in your life. Also, if you like what you hear, please leave a positive review because it helps to bring this podcast to others. But no matter what, may God bless you and may God bring positive change to your life.